when things are kind of going very smoothly, um, it's very hard to think of cartoon ideas. Sometimes something really funny happens, you know, when you're sort of playing around with, you know, the cartoon tropes or whatever, and you're just letting your mind kind of wander. And then suddenly it's like, oh my God, you know, there's that, I never thought about that. That's funny. Um, but this is just kind of, if you can't kind of see it from a certain perspective, I'm not saying like washing a box of Kleenex before putting it on the shelf. It's just so fucking weird, you know? It's like, what am I doing? Roz Chast is a longtime contributor to The New Yorker and the creator of the graphic memoir, Can We Talk About Something More Pleasant? Bill will sometimes say, my husband will say, you haven't left the house for like three days. And it's like, yep, I'm just wandering like I went upstairs, went downstairs. Might move to the couch later, you know? Don't know. Maybe I'll make a banana bread in the kitchen, you know? Uh, but I had this routine where I have a teeny tiny, as a friend of mine calls it, a pomme de terre in the city. It's a little studio apartment rental um, on my beloved Upper West Side. And uh, I have been going there just about every week for two and a half or three and a half days a week. And that of course is not happening now. And that I miss. Um, and I worry a lot about New York. Not that my worrying does anything. And really, if I were a rational person, I would be able to say, since your worrying doesn't do anything, it just makes you feel worse. Why don't you just stop worrying? Because it's really, it takes more energy to block out that worry than it does to worry. And so I'd rather just kind of let it rip, kind of. But, you know, you worry about like what New York is going to look like or whether these businesses are going to come back. And I don't know, all this kind of stuff that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But New York is so much a part of my life because I grew up in Brooklyn. Um, and as soon as I was out of RISD, I came back to New York. And also, you know, it was really funny. It was like, I think um, RISD, I had such a hard time there. And when I came back to New York, it was just lovely, you know? And it wasn't just a New Yorker. It was like, I felt like people, I was, I was getting illustration work. I was getting cartoon work. I just felt like people didn't really care that I couldn't talk the art talk, that I was dorky looking, that I had no idea how to dress, and I still don't. I mean, yeah, Land's End, thanks for the turtlenecks, got them in every mock turtleneck, you know, like really styling. I don't know, it's very hard to know, like, what to think of one's work. I mean, there's times where I do something and I like it so much that I want to like literally like stop people on the street to look at it, you know? And then there's times where I look at my stuff and I think I suck so much. You know, I am so lazy. I'm so awful. Look at all these people who are amazing. I can't draw for shit. You know, I've never learned how to even like letter. I, I suck. They're not fun. You know, just like ripping yourself, you know, beating yourself down as much as you can. Um, so I, I just feel like that has just been part of my life for so long and I can't turn it off. I can't even really completely push it away. But I have a friend who's a writer who has this sort of trick if you can call it a trick, a visualization that he learned from his shrink, which was that when he has that voice in his head that's telling him how terrible he is, and yet he has to write something because he's a he's a writer who's under deadline, you know, he's a, a, a nonfiction writer, um, and he'll just say, "Okay, sit in that chair over there, and just shut up until I'm finished. And when I'm finished, you can you know yell at me and tell me how much I suck all you want, you know." And so sometimes 
that's a bargain I've made. It's like, let me just finish this. And as long as you're not yelling at me and while I'm working, I'll live with it. Uh, William Sean, my very first editor at The New Yorker, talked about with writing, uh, with his writers, the voice. And I think of that as something that applies to so many different arts, but definitely with comics. I'm pulled in by the story. Um, and it can be very abstract, but I don't really care. If it, I would much rather read something that feels personal and interesting and something that I feel like this person really needed to put on paper. And maybe it's done clums or on the tablet, whatever. Um, it, it, uh, I'd much rather see something like that be done in a kind of clumsy way than something that's done very slickly that has just no meaning whatsoever to me. When I was at RISD, it was really the first time that I ever really felt so crappy about my work and about myself because since I was a kid, my work and myself have always been probably unhealthily connected, um, you know, much more so than my physical appearance or something like that, which makes me weird for a girl. But um, I think I think in some ways RISD was like a, getting a very terrible case of a disease and being a little bit more immune when you and, and for that, I am grateful. It was the first time since I was a child, since before I could even remember. I mean, I remember being, I never, until I got to RISD, ever thought I was ever going to do anything except draw. And then when I was at RISD, I felt so horrible about my cartoons specifically. I mean, I learned how to do like fake styles that got more positive attention because cartooning this was, of course, in 73 to 77. Cartooning was not where it was at. Um, there was no respect for cartooning. I mean, first of all, it was just way too personal. Second of all, you couldn't talk about it in terms of like, well, the biometric anthropomorphic, the picture plane, you know, you couldn't give that art speak. You didn't have any you know there was nothing that was like well here's a cartoon you know do you think it's funny that's about it if you say to me like i can't draw or i can't letter or i can't do this really like really gee i'm so surprised like tell me something i don't know you know i i feel worse about my stuff than you can ever make me feel you know so anyway that's my little emotional outburst there in the last couple of years i've gotten like nutty about this hand embroidery and I don't mean like you know little doing a tablecloth with little flowers my grandmother used to do that it was really very cool but um because the the drawing translates into thread and I, it's uh, especially during this time where sometimes I feel like almost like paralyzed with anxiety you know um, I'm finding it very wonderfully uh, kind of bringing the anxiety down and like this wonderful combination of being excited, but also not, um, it's like the perfect drug, you know, it brings you up, uh, but you're not jittery. The things that I get like really angry about and really anxious about are sometimes very funny. I actually had to get out of the bathtub because I convinced myself that the bathtub was somehow going to, because water was so heavy and our house is old, that the bathtub was going to definitely crash through the floor and I was going to be killed. And, and uh, you know, and I did get out of the bath and then I just could not stop laughing. It was like, but at the time I had really talked myself into this, you know, <laughs> total, total panic. 
I don't know if you can hear this, my parrot in the background. Oh, I've been listening to your parrot the whole, oh, the whole time. Been going, I love you. <laughs> I love you. It's really funny. Years ago, and I wish I remembered the title of the book. This is such a horrible book. I was, I, maybe it's good I didn't get it. It was a book. I was in a bookstore back in like the days where borders and stuff. And there was a book that came out about how people's lives changed like like an unexpected tragedy happened in like <laughs> it's so horrible in like a second it was like you know you're like sitting there and suddenly like a car crashes into your house <laughs> you know and so that's um <laughs> you know that's kind of like my deep down how I feel like almost all the time it's like right now like a car could just suddenly although there's fewer cars out now because of the, the coronavirus so there well it's like I said to somebody well there'll be fewer school shootings you know I, I always look for the silver lining